Hey, welcome to the Do Good Work podcast. Today, we're talking to Janelle Amos. Janelle is the founder of Elevate Growth and a demand gen software as a service consultant. She's a former in-house of demand gen who took her experience from several startups to pursue her own aspirations of becoming a business owner. We dive into that in the podcast. As a founder of Elevate Growth, she is the lead of the demand generating consulting firm and is passionate about helping B2B SaaS companies create go-to-market strategies to catapult their demand gen efforts and achieve revenue numbers. And she's on a mission to help B2B SaaS marketing leaders solve go-to-market challenges to attract quality pipeline and advocate for more marketing dollars. Janelle, thanks for being on. Hi, thanks for having me. There's like a, I wouldn't call it like a content army, but there's a lot of people that post daily on LinkedIn that I follow and you're one of them. So I reached out, had you in the pod here, and it's exciting to finally get to speak to you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thank you so much for following and engagement with my content. That means a lot. Yeah, it's pretty unique though, because I, I know there's there's different, we'll talk about the different stances when it comes to marketing, when it comes to demand capture, demand creation, why people think that demand creation can be a myth or can be very difficult and it requires a lot of ad dollars, which or just dollars in general, which it may or may not. But I, I find it very interesting though, that your journey to entrepreneurship because you took a, a stance you mentioned as moral code and work ethic. And I want to dive deep into that first, if you don't mind. Can you tell us a little yeah. bit more about why start on your own and why go on your own? Yeah, it's actually an interesting story because it's the non-conventional way of branching out. I didn't have any side hustle or anything that I was doing as a side gig prior to branching out. I know a lot of people feel comfortable doing that first, matching their salary, and then doing the flip. I pretty much went cold turkey. So this is a very <laughs> neat <laughs> interaction and it's been a very fun almost year. It'll be a year in December. So I never really thought about branching out on my own either. It wasn't really? until I was actually in-house. Yeah, I was head of demand gen at the last four startups that I had been at. And I just, my whole career journey was that I wanted to be a CMO. I wanted to lead a large enterprise corporation. And that's what I wanted to do. That was my corporate dream, right? And I never really thought anything of it until this last role that I was in-house at as director of demand gen. And within 30 days of joining, mm -hmm. and you still have that hoorah, we're excited to be here. You're a fresh new face. You're learning so much. Within 30 days, I was posed with a question that I didn't feel was ethically appropriate to your point, the moral code behind that. And fortunately, they gave me 30 days to decide, to think on it and better understand if I was okay with making that decision. And But at the end of the day, it was either make the decision given or to be discharged. There was oh, white wow, or black. Indeed. Yeah, it was very much one or the other. And so for that 30 day duration where it was my chance to make that decision, the very first two weeks, I was just sitting on what I would do, like really understanding what the implications of each decision would be. If I gave in or if I walked away, where would I go to? How could mm -hmm. I live with making that decision if I stayed? And so I... Pulse checked different groups of people who know me a little bit differently. So I had my friends, my family, and like my professional network. And I was asking them, some of them I went into details, other ones was a little bit more hypothetical. And I said, what would you do? If mm. you were here presented with this, what would you do? And it was really mixed from my friends and family, to be honest. And a lot of really? my friends and family, they were saying, stay, don't be stupid. That's salary, stay. Oh, but my, my professional God. network, which actually is what sparked me on a limb, was saying life's too short to have a corporation determine the success of your health, of your mentality. Like you're the one at the end of the day mm. that has to live with that, sleep with that, do that. And they were like, nobody should dictate that of your life. And that really sat with me. And I was like, you know what? I get that my friends and family, like they know me and not a lot of them are in business. I think maybe one or two are, but the people from a professional standpoint were the ones telling me there's a market for you. You can do it. Don't That's let this company, yeah, take you in that direction. And fortunately, that is what gave me the fire behind my shoes. And then so after those first two weeks, I was like, listen, I can't make this decision. I, I really can't. And I have a daughter and I'm responsible for teaching her how to be bold and brave and ethical and to shoot for the stars, right? And it's like, how can I live that out? If How can I help her live that out if I don't do that myself? Yeah, and usually that, like that, having that mirror, right? That little mini, yeah. you, I see my little mini me and I'm like, yeah, I could act up or that, what kind of example am I setting? And we don't have to dive into the thing that they were asking you to do. Yeah. But if they're asking you to bend something that is against your ethos and it's against your moral code and it actually does 
you know, that to me is pretty, pretty substantial. But the decision to go solo, I think you had encouragement to do so. Mm-hmm. Talk to us a little bit about that transition. Cause I remember my transition of jumping and it was quote unquote, some security. You got a cash flow, had clients, had the whole thing going and then you're full time. What do you do? I'd love to know how that, the jump, you called it the flip, how that flip go. Yeah, totally. So the same people that were cheering me on and encouraging me to go in that direction were fortunately the people who have kept me afloat totally transparently. So a lot of them have either been consultants or they are current business owners and they're no longer in the nine to five. And they were the ones who were referring business. And so the very mm-hmm. first client that I landed that helped me replace that next month's salary of just walking away cold turkey was because of a referral. Super grateful for that. Try to do mm-hmm. as best as work as I could with that. Although you're still learning so much, right? It was, I didn't mm-hmm. know what I didn't know. And how do we base a business off of this? And is this the right direction? Am I even good at what I do? And so fortunately- <laughs> setting in, right? <laughs> when you really are, I mean, leading demand for four, <laughs> four startups. Yeah, there's a track record there. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. But yeah, mostly it was just that transition of just trusting the people who once believed in you. And then when you have doubts, going back and just asking for guidance or advice and sometimes just a pulse check. No, 100%. I think it's important for us to even keep a wins journal because, you know, I think just as a perspective, like as we think about, am I capable of doing something? Odds are you normally are mostly capable of doing nearly everything within the physical realm. We can't fly without a plane, right? So keep it real. But we can do that, but sometimes we have internal doubts and I keep a wind journal or like a journey, like a journal from the journey. Just share those wins because then now you have tangible proof that, hey, I've actually done something like this before. Therefore, I can actually do something like this before. You need both the emotional and the rationale. Then you can actually believe that you can do it so you can actually do it. And going to your point, I I think it's important. Like I've had past mentors or coaches and guides who's like, hey, you got something here. You should go for it. And I think that spark, I think we always need that community and that, that network to help us to thrive. So you made the flip, you're getting referrals. As a perspective from, for me, when I hire or work with vendors or team, like you no know, fractional leaders, I think, again, not to add too much kudos here, but I think it's important to look at people like you who need to make it work because you will oh, work that. exceedingly on your craft to succeed. And I think that's actually as business owners or whoever's listening to this, if you're a buyer looking into the marketplace, are you going to be working with some service agency where you're the 257th client and you're working with a junior and you're not actually talking to the strategist, or are you actually working with the person, the strategist, the leader who knows the craft, does the craft, consults on the craft, and builds on the craft. So I think there is a balance between that. And even when I talk to business owners who are growing, like we ask them, do you want to stay boutique or do you want to go very commercial? And there's a balance. What is your take on that, on the boutique versus like high growth, high volume? Just for where I want to take my business personally or just like recommendations or? Well, your perspective. This is all about like your perspective, your journey. So your perspective around that, but also like where do you want to take it? Yeah, I think it's important to analyze where you want to go and to focus on that. I know a lot of people put pressure on individuals who branch out on their own. And they Mm -hmm. say, where do you want to go? Do you want to build a team? Are you hiring? And it's a lot of pressure to figure out what you want to do. And it can be really intimidating. So I don't think that you have to figure it out from the jump. I don't think your Mm -hmm. business is going to be successful if you change. It's not going to be successful if you change in six months down the road. I think you're the business owner. You can decide that and you can figure out what works and you can test different things. For me personally, I left corporate world for a reason. And part of it is I don't really want to get back into it. Like it's going to take me a lot to get back into it. I was having this conversation with somebody else earlier, just a peer from fellow LinkedIn. And (laughs) we were talking about the different directions that we wanted to take our businesses. And I was like, I just, I don't like managing people. It's like, I don't want to hire anybody. I don't want to grow. I don't even want subcontractors. I was like, and part of that is my value add. Because what you you get, I'm not going to hand you off to somebody else that's junior or somebody else that doesn't understand your business. Like I'm going to be the one that's invested in you. I'm going to be the one that's helping you. And this is my experience. And if we're a good partner, like we can really be rock stars together. And so part of that is figure out what you want to do and figure out how you work best and then just play off of that. No, 100%. I would, one, yeah, probably never going back to hint, hint, it's not going to happen. But you mentioned something I think that's important too. Like you don't have to figure it out if you're like, if you're listening to this, you want to do the flip, you want to do the jump. Like you don't have to figure it out immediately. You just have to have direction because one thing that is always constant and true. And if I look at people, when I started working with teams or working remote online and was it 15 or 2016, it's not too long ago, but anyone who's stuck to their craft is either a leader or being very successful in what they're doing. So the key thing is keep doing it. 
because it's really hard to beat someone who doesn't give up. And if you don't give up, like that consistency. The other thing too that I find interesting and I actually want to challenge you on is what about if you're doing the things that you're not 100% the best at or that aren't the highest value for the clients, like maybe sending that invoice, like would you still have like assistance or and have all like that business of one with little peripherals? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. 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 So the way that I've structured my business so far is to outsource the non-billable stuff. So Mm -hmm. looking at, for example, I do a lot of video, I do my podcasts and I have a video editor that I have on a monthly retainer that I just help because that's, that takes time away from me being billable to my clients. And that's just stuff for the business. So for that stuff, I'll outsource and I'll pay subcontractors for, but when it comes to work for my clients and stuff that I'm truly passionate about, that's where I kind of want to just wrap my arms around because that's the work that I want to be doing as an entrepreneur, the lifestyle that I want to be doing. I want to work with a handful of really great clients and I just want to have my lifestyle. I want to do good work with them and I just go about life. I I don't really want to worry about if somebody's having a negative interaction with my clients because I'm not client facing anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't want to know about fire drills happening because something broke in the system and now I have to be brought. I just don't want to deal with any of that. But when it comes to other stuff in my business, how can I focus on optimizing for stuff that can bring my attention to the stuff that are that's actually billable? That's the way that I think about it. Revenue generating or thinking mm-hmm. you can't outsource thought and anyone who outsources their thought, you can tell in their content. This is, what is it? Yeah. It's content less. It doesn't really have any substance. Yeah. To so I write um, my own po- podcast content and I film it myself. And then from there, I ship it on to my video editor who then chops it up and sends it to me. So yeah, to your point, definitely inc- you need to be that content owner. Exactly. The thinking, the strategy. So anything mm-hmm. related to the highest value contribution. There's a trend that I'm seeing a lot in specifically on LinkedIn some Twitter, but mostly with the LinkedIn is like leaving for lifestyle and being able to have, you know, sustainability over time, but also balancing that lifestyle. And I've seen this in the past as well, but I've seen it rise again over the last two, three years. And I want to get your perspective on balancing the business needs, which essentially it's your, the business of one, but then also balancing that with lifestyle and still creating the value add, not only at work, but at home, because I think that's an important component, like with family and personal, um, but also looking at the long term. How do you balance all those components? That's a really good question. I don't know if I have one solid answer or advice to that, but no one has the crystal ball, right? Yeah, I don't think it's a crystal (laughs) ball, but I think it's just figuring out what you want first and then trying to make sure that you're not running before you're walking. Mm -hmm. And so I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, like what I wanted as a lifestyle, right? I'm not there yet. It's like, but that's what I'm building too. Like for me, I'm still very much working like my nine to five, right? But it's for my business now. And I'm doing after hours and I'm working at night or whatnot, but it's still, I still feel like I'm trugging through my normal business hours, but I'm just, now I'm responsible for how I make the most out of that time. So that's a really challenging balance between justifying stuff that's non-billable because you're like, it's, it, I don't actually get paid to do this. But if you think long term, it'll bring the business revenue. It'll bring something for the business later. And so that's the way that I like to think about it. But in general, just think about making sure that you map out the steps to getting there and what lifestyle you want. And then making sure that you start taking the steps to get there instead of just saying, hey, I'm an entrepreneur. I only want to work like two hours a day but nobody knows you and you can't lend any clients. I want two yeah, hours yeah. a day at high dollar value. You're not going to get that right off the jump. And if you do, let me know your secrets because I would <laughs> love that. But no, for real, just make sure you're on a path to get there. Yeah, redesigning and working from the ground up. You mentioned something that I want to jump into in just a second. But I, with the two hour a day thing, I think a lot of people aim and want that. But I also believe that when you get that, you're like, I'm bored. I need more. I mean, that's the nature of the entrepreneur. Usually, It's the entrepreneur mindset. Yeah, think about it. Who would leave a nine to five to work a nine to nine? It doesn't, so that's something to think about. But you're very intentional with, at least from what I saw, your marketing approach, like when cold turkey, but then you were very intentional to do very specific things in very specific marketing channels. And you also mentioned it too. You're like, you're not getting paid to do the pod. You're not getting paid to write content every day. You're not getting... So I'd love to know why you're doing what you're doing, because I think this leads into demand gen. And I want to understand your level of thinking around that, because you're right, that is a balance. Like, I'm not getting paid to do this, but also long term, it's an influx. It creates an influx or inbound. Tell me about that and how you're marrying your strategic mind that you know 
based on your current needs, as well as you got to make whatever revenue this quarter or this year? Yeah, it's a great question. Part of it is it's a challenge as an entrepreneur because I work with startups and companies that actually have a marketing budget that have dollars to do type of advertising and productions and all these great things. When you extract all of that and you're on your own as an entrepreneur, you get really bootstrapped in terms of what you want to spend. And so when we apply that lens in terms of what is actually a feasible channel for me to grow my business that is also cost effective and can quickly prove ROI, that's how I got to the point of where I'm at today. You also have to look at where your buyers are. For me, I target VP, head of marketing and or founders, potentially head of sales, depending on the level of the startup and who they started hiring first, marketing or sales. So those individuals are on LinkedIn. It'd be a no brainer for me to have something going on LinkedIn. A lot of people right now are still trying to get their voice out on LinkedIn, but they're too shy to do it in a video format. So when we think about marketing as a whole, we also have to think not only where our audience is, but then how do we break through the noise? And video is one of those components where not a lot of people are doing it right now mm -hmm. in video. And I'm starting to see a lot more faces, which is amazing. And I love seeing that transition, but it was a really great way for me to start breaking through the noise and to start like letting myself be seen. And I've also started testing another platform, which is TikTok, and trying to see how I can translate that as well, because the very early stages of TikTok are among us. And if my yeah. audience for marketing and sales are also on LinkedIn, they're also a consumer on another platform called TikTok. So really trying to find a way to apply my own marketing strategic lens to how I would go about my business with what I've seen work with my experience, as well as how I know that my audience consumes their content and then finding a way to break through that noise. Yeah, you're going with different and videos. Obviously, it's not like super high production value when we do, but it's still a lot of work. Working with video is very annoying. Yes, <laughs> but, plus one to that. <laughs> oh yeah, this is why this podcast still is audio and I've been told to do video. We should probably change that. but. So you're, again, going back, you're seeing where your buyers are at, how you're positioning yourself and have you proven, because how long have you been doing the content on the feed? So content on LinkedIn has been since January consistently. Okay. Podcast has been since April and TikTok has been since April or so, March or April. Yeah. Okay, cool. And I think the key thing here is that you're niching down to a specific value add. I go to this channel to learn this specific thing or this specific outcome as opposed to like general, a generalized approach. Yeah. And I feel like that's just like a marketing basic that if you're a marketer and you don't do that, like I'm going to ding you because you have to understand <laughs> how each channel wants their content to be consumed. And, and this is actually a lesson for me that I'll share publicly. I was doing my podcast and I was chopping that up. I was putting it on LinkedIn, which is a traditional approach to that. But then I was also taking those same snippets and putting it on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And the initial thought behind that was to grow my TikTok following with more LinkedIn networks. So I started posting it on TikTok first and would share that TikTok video to LinkedIn so people could see that I'm posting on TikTok with my handle. I quickly realized that wasn't the right approach because one, the vertical phone specs for LinkedIn is, it shortens it. So you only have a it's little a four bit. four five. Yeah. 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 It's the portrait versus the, the landscape, one. right? Yeah. So not really having the format that's optimized for LinkedIn. So I'm actually undergoing sneak peek for my new brand, a different way to have that portrayed on LinkedIn. I was also just doing the cut up snippets and putting that on TikTok, right? As I mentioned, the problem with that is TikTok likes content to be very much attention capturing the first like three seconds and then information on that and wrap up like all things one video and one to where a podcast it's only like a snippet of a thought in a couple seconds mm -hmm. or three minutes right so it's really hard for users to get that value add right there within that short amount of short form content and so i personally started taking what i was posting on linkedin and like recording it myself pretty much all over again with that thought oh, wow. process that i would put on linkedin native in TikTok's recording version. And within, I don't know, the last 10 days, I've increased my followers within like 30%. You can just see the nativeness of using TikTok versus trying to upload to TikTok. And I'm getting engagement, I'm getting likes, I'm getting comments, I'm getting new followers, all within the people that are my ICP. Because people are talking about other companies, they're talking about oh, wow. LinkedIn. So you definitely, I'm definitely reaching the right audience. And now I'm like, yo, I could have been doing this for months ago, but that's how you learn. Marketing <laughs> well, is how yes. you learn, this test. So yeah, that's just, and in you the know, beginning, it's never going to be, it's never going to be good. Anytime you start, every time I start something new or like I do the writing or I did the podcast, or, like I know I'm going to suck for a long time <laughs> and then it's going to get better. That's how but, you get better. Yeah. But then you think you're doing so well and then three months or nine months go by, you're like, wow, that sucked. 
but I'm doing so much better now. But that's <laughs> looking how you at get my better. stuff. <laughs> no, I know. But no, I think it's let's bring it back to the strategy. But I think you're right to focus on the specific channels that you're that you're marketing in or that you're posting in. But again, you know who you're targeting. You're messaging correctly based on the medium, but then you're also leveraging a podcast, which you can leverage into audio and then video. Mm -hmm. But this is for you to create an ecosystem around like drawing a circle around your buyers and people who could be potential buyers for you. This, I, I kind of want to demystify thing in the past. It was vague. And I know with Chris Walker's work, it's been very helpful to see, but I still want to create clarity around branding, demand gen, with the new terminology. Why is it new? Has it been new? Or was it always here? Is it different? I want to just get your perspective on that because to me, demand gen is top of funnel awareness that's always been here, but you can do that at scale. That's just me being ignorant because I come from the direct response world, like direct response marketing online. So I know like the whole funnel pieces. So I'd love to know your perspective, demand gen, demand capture, and branding. Yeah, I don't think it's considered ignorance if you're curious to learn. So I'll give you oh. kudos there. But Thanks. Personally, demand gen, it's a full funnel initiative. Demand gen is essentially generating demand for the business as a whole and at scale. And so when mm -hmm. we think about what generates demand, that's more than just a top of funnel piece of content. That's more than just a bottom funnel piece of content. It's more than just a head count. It's more than just one channel. So when mm -hmm. we think about how do we make that successful, you start doing that from well-rounded lens. And another thing that I'll add on top of, I think Chris Walker has been phenomenal at coining the terms for create demand and capturing demand. Mm -hmm. But I've actually added a third part to that where it's maintaining demand to mm -hmm. where not only is it that you have to create awareness, you have to capture that awareness, but you also have to maintain a healthy customer engagement and relationships and referrals because oh, yeah. referrals at the end of the day come back. And if you have happy customers, that's how you grow a business as well. That's a channel that's often forgotten. And so I like mm -hmm. to focus on those True. three, which is what totally closes the circle from a full funnel perspective. If we think about it just like in a funnel strategic lens. From the customer journey, of course, when you take mm -hmm. a client and they duplicate themselves, that's the best acquisition cost ever. It's one plus. But let's, as you dive into that though, because I think you said it beautifully, it's a whole encompassing of the business. How can a business measure their effect or the net effect of their demand generation? So great questions. I think a lot of it is we have to take out of the niche of demand gen. So the way that I define demand gen is a go-to-market strategy. So a company has to decide upfront what strategy they want to deploy. So you'll hear things like lead generation. You'll hear things like demand generation. You'll hear things like ABM, which is account-based marketing. There's all these different go-to-market techniques that one can use. One may not necessarily be right or wrong, depending on what you want to do and what you want to go about, right? So demand gen is essentially just a tactic of a go-to-market business. So once we decide that's a tactic, that's no longer just a marketing initiative, that's a business initiative, right? So now yeah. everybody from the business, both product, customer success, sales, marketing, are now looking at how we can deploy a demand gen motion. If we take the same lens for an ABM motion, ABM is not successful if it's just marketing deploying it. You still need to have sales, right? And you need to have that alignment and collaboration. So same thing goes from a demand gen lens. So when we talk about how to actually measure the success and the impact of a demand gen strategy, we start looking at the implications to revenue, which is at the end of the day, the, what the business wants out of this go-to-market strategy is to attract and drive revenue for the business, which is closed one opportunities. So when we start looking at a high level, how much does it cost as a business to invest in everything, headcount, tech, salary, strategies, advertising budget, everything that goes into all budgets, not only just marketing, again, sales, headcount, tech, all that stuff. In comparison to landing just one customer, what does that ratio look like? Like the true CAC, the true cost That's a CAC model, which Chris yeah. Walker also talks about tremendously. So that's how you measure the efficiency of a go-to-market foundational strategy, such as demand gen. As somebody deploys demand gen and they get a little bit more sophisticated, you can start understanding, is that ratio healthy? You can start understanding how we can prove the efficiency and longevity of those type of customers. For example, if we close at a really great dollar value, but they churn in six months, that's not the longevity of a good investment, right? Mm -hmm. So we, what we want to do is we have, want to have a longevity of healthy customers staying, renewing, and not having a high churn rate while still capturing customers at a really profitable cost. That's yeah. a healthy go-to-market approach. And that's how you should be measuring your business. Because it's quality of customers. And then also, like you mentioned, when you have buying from all the business units and all the functions, I mean, you can even start looking at compensations for sales. That's the customer lifetime value if you sell someone. But not each customer is always the same and not each customer should actually buy. 
exactly. from you. Break this break this illusion for me then, because I, I do see a lot of like top of funnel, middle funnel, bottom of funnel with demand gen. And I'm just curious, is it because it's a new term that I'm confusing it, but it's a holistic approach. It's go to market and we can do a plethora of things, content, direct response, paid ads, organic referrals, social influencers, et cetera, a native app. The list is endless pretty much. Is it just picking the right marketing mix and then measuring across the efficiency of the entire business and ensuring that we attract the right customers with the right mediums to equal high customer lifetime value? Yeah, precisely. Okay, cool. Thank you for making it like simple to understand. It's always uh, it's always interesting to get that concept again coming from direct response, paid ads, hardcore. Yeah. I'm glad you're front. able to actually understand that breakdown because I am the podcast host of Demand Gen Made Simple. So if I wasn't able to simplify it down, <laughs> it does it, your branding like, doesn't oh, align. Awesome. It'll yeah, align. So- What's exciting you the most? You're working with other business owners in the work that you do now, but also collaborating with other solopreneurs or one-person businesses, which is a huge trend right now. What excites you the most when you do that kind of work, but then also on the demand gen side, what excites you the most for your industry and for the work, the type of work you do? That's a really good question. I don't think anybody's actually asked me that before. When I look at the type of work that I do, actually, it excites me a lot as an entrepreneur to be able to just get myself out there and start getting that market feedback. And so I like connecting with other solopreneurs and business owners on the feedback that they're seeing and comparing notes to say, are we seeing the same things and trends in markets? I think that's been really valuable to framing how I position myself as well. When I work with my clients, I have a true passion for deploying demand gen strategies and the execution and tactical side of that. So I get excited working with them, really understanding how I can solve their challenge because everybody either they don't have marketing at all because they're a startup where they had some agency and they just were slandered by it. And so they're looking for help to get back on track. And so really coming in and identifying what those unique challenges are and then being that person that can help them solve that and then bring that to fruition as well. Fruition, sorry, will mm-hmm. help. That That's just, I don't know, I'm a problem solver, I guess, at heart. And so being able to do that for my clients excites me. It's, it's obviously the number one key thing to, to drive value and make wins. For all of our listeners out there, where is the best place for people to, one, thank you for being on today, and two, learn a little bit more about you and where to find you online? Yeah, no, first, thanks for taking the time to listen. As you've heard, I'm active on LinkedIn, so you can find me at Janelle Amos on TikTok. It's at Janelle Amos, or you can send me an email personally. It's Janelle at elevate-growth.com, which is my business name. I look forward to connecting. Wonderful. Thanks for being on. We'll put those links in the show notes. If you found value in today's podcast, please consider sharing this with someone that you believe could also benefit from this episode. You never know, you may be the catalyst that opens them up to a new way of operating their business and experiencing life. As always, it's an honor to be a small part of your journey. This is Raul Hernandez. Do good work.